even more stunning to us because I really did not expect this. When we asked them, if money were not an issue, would you specialize in one of these sectors or the other? And almost across the board, they said, no, we would distribute our time more equally among these sectors because we actually really learn something from every one of them. And here's an example. Again, I don't know, these are just slides are so dark. Is it possible, like these lights here are just so bright? Is it possible to change the lighting at all? Just are you? I don't know. They just, I'm used to seeing them so much brighter. I think that's what it is. But anyway, this is um, a wonderful woman whose name is just escaping me at the moment. I, I can't believe it is. Who is a Filipina um, American, uh, but she's also a Native American and African American because her father was a, in the military service when she was born in the Philippines. And she's an amazing visual artist. This is an example of, of her sculptural work. But actually, her main job is being. Her main paint job is being a drag king. So it turns out that in burlesque, there's a small number of women who play men, and she is really good at this. And, uh, but her community work consists of this marvelous group that she formed with other Filipina lesbians, and they do these humorous performances that are uh, addressed to their own Filipino community about being Filipino lesbians. <laughs> And it's a really, really amazing, you can just see from the group the, how much fun they have and you know how supportive they are. One more example, Marcus Shelby, a wonderful bassist, jazz bassist here in the middle, has a big band, jazz big band in San Francisco. He has really done some of the things that Roberto and others were talking about this morning about being you know, preservers of history and reminding us of our history. He's done a really wonderful job of this. One of the things he's done is to do these oratorios about African American history. And his first one was about Port Chicago. Does anybody know what Port Chicago is? <laughs> Roberto knows what it is. In World War II, port, the Port Chicago explosion at an ammo ammunition depot in the Bay Area was the single largest you know, in the United States fatality in World War II. And it involved 400 African-American workers. They were actually sailors in the Navy um, when this huge you know, ammunition thing blew up. And they died. And the remaining workers went on strike and said, you know, we need better health and safety conditions. And they were given dishonorable discharges by the US Navy. Marcus Shelby wrote this oratorio and he took it, which was many pieces, and took it all over the Bay Area to communities. And, and he found survivors that were still, had, you know, lived through this experience and had, you know, had no money <laughs> from the Navy or no compensation or recognition. And the result of that was not only for this community to reconnect with this experience, but also to get them, you know, get, get the uh, Navy to make an apology and change their lives. So what one, artists can do. It's really pretty amazing. And he's also done one of Sojourner Truth, which I haven't even heard or seen. He also runs a cafe called Cafe Royale with a partner in San Francisco. And in addition to providing studio space for visual artists and musicians, he, um, every winter, every Wednesday night, he gives a history of jazz um, session for free to anybody in the community who wants to come and sort of explains how the rhythms are come from African music or how blues turn into jazz, and then they perform and jam. And you know, again, it's the idea of community service. This woman, Tamara Hotwin, probably gave us the most articulate, because we did many interviews also um, in the Bay Area and LA. She gave us the most articulate explanation for why she really loved doing this crossover work. And when this is, she's a, a top Hollywood studio musician. She's probably on about 140. Um, film score recordings, and she explained to us how they do it, which blew me away. She said, you walk into the studio, they slap the music down in front of you, there's no rehearsal, you know, there are other musicians, you just have to play it perfectly the first time through, and your instrument can't be, have any individual character, it has to be just perfect, and you don't play the whole piece of music, you only play the part they're gonna put in the film. So, this is like, you know, and on the other hand, she works for two of the regional nonprofit symphonies in the, in the Los Angeles area. And those she describes as 
really working with other people, getting a lot of attention from the conductor rehearsals, working with people in other art forms, really, you know, bringing the best out of the music is a very satisfying thing. Of course, it pays a lot less. <laughs> so, but she defends both of those experiences and said that even the studio music experience really kept her on her toes and was a very good discipline and that she really learned a lot from it. So I thought that that was a very articulate you know, uh, response to that as a whole. Um, as you probably know, artists tend to be well-educated, although they're, they're all really, if you looked at artists across the board, you find many who have you know, no education, to a Bill Gates story or something like that. But uh, it is really true that artists that report in the census that um, being an artist is their major occupation are more apt to be white um, and non-immigrant than the populations as a whole, the places that they live. And these are what they look like from the census for um, Los Angeles, San Francisco, San Jose, et cetera, and, uh, and also the immigrant stamps. One thing that we felt really good about in our survey result, results, we had worked with many, many organizations all over California to reach artists, was that actually we had lower uh, numbers of white people responding than the census did as a whole, but we did still underreach Latino um, uh, and Hispanic respondents, even though we tried very hard and had, um, you know, we had Vietnamese and, and Spanish and other versions on our website. And that's just an ongoing concern. Part of it is the fact that um, higher education is often really part of artist experience and that's less accessible to a lot of people. Now, one other thing I just want to mention as an economist, there's a huge, you know, there are a whole group of us cultural economists and um, there are actually, there's a famous article called The Starving Artist myth or reality, and in it the guy really argues that artists actually are really willing to work for less because they love what they're doing, they feel what they're doing is really useful, kind of the Buddhist idea of right livelihood, and so they don't care as much about money. And I think this is true, um, you know, again, of some artists and not others, but I think that the, the um, the really interesting, dangerous thing right now is that there is, you know, there's this huge emphasis on you know, we, everybody needs a college education. And then there are these attempts to really redo college education by saying some careers are worth more than others. And there's this very, very uh, terrible study by Carnivali et al. out of Georgetown, which is called, you know, Work for Hire, and really, you know, suggests that it, there are, people are over-credentialed. So a lot of artists are over-credentialed because they make less money than people in other fields, and they should be studying other fields. That's the implication. The implication is that money is the only important thing. And it's, I really am just warning you because you're going to be hearing about it. It's a very big debate out there about this right now. And um, I think it's really important for us to defend the right of artists to um, you know, uh, pursue the things that really make them happy and uh, not you know, uh, believe that, that income. I'm not saying that artists shouldn't do better than they're doing, but, and many of them want to. One of the really interesting things we've learned from the Strategic National Arts and Alumni Project, which I serve on the advisory board for it, I think is an amazing, amazing effort. It's, um, we have five years of survey data now from uh, arts high schools, conservatories, colleges, and university arts programs um, from uh, graduates of those programs on what their experiences have been as artists, what they think about how their education was, and almost all of them say that they didn't get enough training about how to, how to have a career as an artist. I mean, it's just sort of universally there. Uh, but one of the really interesting things we found is that lots of them are working within the arts. Lots of them in arts education, uh, design, fine arts, and musicians, if you're, I, you might be have a hard time, and so on. But um, many of them are working outside of the arts in all kinds of different occupations, administration, you know, personal care. I can't even really read them here. I don't see how you could possibly either, but anyway. Um, and when they're surveyed about it, many of them argued that their arts training was very useful to them in the job that they're doing. So that's another really important thing to, to really keep in mind. And we just had a big conference around our SNAP thing called Three Million Artists, and we had one panel of basically scientists, psychologists, and education professors um, documenting all the scientific breakthroughs that had basically come from artists, and it was really mind-blowing, very wonderful. And I think those papers will be available soon. 
Okay, artists really also work in many industries, and um, their uh, their one set of industries we kind of call the cultural industries because artists are a large portion of the workforce. And I don't mean 50%, but they're much you know, more prominent in those industries than they are in the economy as a whole. And then there are other industries just where there are a lot of artists because they're big industries. So these are the cultural industries. The top one is a throwaway industry because they don't know what to do with independent artists, so they just sort of bundled them in with performing artists. And <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But anyway, and you can see they're 45% of, of their industry. Why am I getting, oops, did I really, yeah, okay, sorry. And um, I'm just getting used to this new thing here. Uh, but also other professional, technical, and scientific services, those are photographers, <coughs> and they tend to work in the it, it, things that are classified. And then the other ones are pretty obvious, sound recording, motion pictures, radio, TV, broadcasting, advertising, publishing, religious organizations. You know, artists form, uh, you know, five times as larger share of artists in religious organizations than the economy as a whole. And by the way, a third of all American musicians that report on the census work for religious organizations. Think about that. I just gave a really interesting evening talk at Cornell University when I was a guest there for a week on why can't we talk about religion when we talk about art? <laughs> and I'll just leave that at that for the moment. Yep. Um, okay. Um, the industries that uh, employ lots of artists, but where artists aren't a really big part of that, part of it's just the definition of these sectors, civic uh, organizations, et cetera, printing, uh, management, amusement, gambling, recreation, colleges and universities, 20,000 um, artists uh, in college. And by the way, people are supposed in the census, if I'm teaching a university teacher like Sonia, I should be putting down teacher, and that's what I always put down. I never put down economist. But uh, their universities employ a lot of other artists in other um, forms. Uh, computer systems, restaurant and food service, elementary and secondary schools. So artists are in a lot, a lot of different places in terms of the industries that they work in. This slide I threw in because I think it's such a fabulous depiction of how complex artist relationship is really to other elements in the economy. It's a wonderful diagram done by Bill Byers, who's a professor of geography at University of Washington for the Mayor's Initiative Seattle City of Music, which came out of musicians in Seattle and venue owners complaining about the city's tight regulations on noise and other things, and turned into a very, very positive relationship, you know, eventually by electing a music-friendly mayor. So he asked Bill Byers to do this, say, well, wh what is the music industry in Seattle? Is it just really the symphony orchestra and the stuff at Seattle Center and these venues, or what else is going on? So this is what Bill found, and he did it by going out and talking to everybody. So up here in the corner, up in your upper left-hand corner are musicians, and down here are consumers. And these are all the different actors that are really involved in this process. So up here, sheet music, writers and composers, instructors, instruments, instrument repairers, all the musician service people, including springboards for the arts. So a whole bunch of people there they're interacting with. Then this is live music venues here. All music, all the different things that are involved with that, the venues themselves, the monitors, the speakers, live music cons con consumed via live broadcast, like Prairie Home Companion, uh, involving other kinds of devices. This is the um, uh, uh, recording industry right here. Again, lots and lots of different industries involved in it, right down to wholesalers and retailers. This one is digital distribution of music which is online real, you know, retailers, digital distribution, streaming, and so on. And this one is music on other platforms, like games, media, movies, and everything else. So really, it's, and actually there's a wonderful Future Music Coalition and a young woman named Jean Cook who's doing amazing surveying of musicians to find out just what their relationships really are to these other sectors. And one of the things she's uncovered is that, you know, the the incomes that musicians report on the census, they're not subtracting all their costs from it. So actually they're making a lot less than you would think they are, which is not really too surprising to us, right? I kind of have a feeling about that overall. Um, this, by the way, uh, is reproduced in my uh, city creative industry strategy, which is my portion of the Otis Creative Economy Report, um, which was published in December and, and unveiled in LA. Um, I'm going to talk some about artists and plays because I have been teaching in urban planning for all these years 
And I've always, I'm really a regional scientist. I'm an economist, so I turn, why is, why is there, what is it, is the mic? Oh, it's because I'm bumping into it or something. Oh. It's like, whoa, it's not me. If I could just quiet down a little bit better. So if we really want to understand placemaking and artists, we should know something about where artists are. So I think that I've spent a lot of time doing this, and I really think these are interesting. These are the numbers from the 2000 census. Again, the 2010, there just isn't the same long-form occupational thing. You have to use the American Community Survey. So this is the kind of best we have. Um, and it's not changed really that much since then. So. Basically what this says is that there are three times as many artists in the LA metropolitan area workforce than there are in the United States as a whole. And these are the other uh, you know, cities that have over-representations of artists in their workforce. New York, San Francisco, Washington, Seattle, Boston, Minneapolis, San Diego, Miami. Where's Chicago? Uh, well, that's interesting. Chicago's only about at the US uh, average. And that's really because of the composition effect. Uh, and that's because there are actually still a lot of blue collar workers in Chicago. So they make a bit bigger part of the workforce so that artists don't look as big, but actually there are you know, really, really large numbers. I think I computed that there are more artists in Chicago metro area than LA, but I'm, I can't remember for sure if that's true. Now interestingly, I, I, I put Phoenix in here today. So Phoenix in 2000 was just a little bit below the national average. Some other fast growing places were below. San Jose, Houston, Texas, and then there were some older industrial cities that were below. But I think the bottom line here is that really there are some older industrial cities have done very well in terms of making, of being artist friendly and nurturing the arts and that would include Boston and to some extent Minneapolis um, and New York. Uh, and then there are some that have done poorly and vice versa. The same thing with fast growing places. I just also like to point out that Performing artists especially are very concentrated in LA and New York and that's because of the big media industry. So you have very large concentrations there. Musicians are the group that are the most spread out. Um, you know, it's kind of most balanced across these metropolitan areas. And part of that is because so many of them work for religious organizations, which are very local serving. Um, artists work varies a lot from metropolitan area to metropolitan area um, because of the nature of the cultural industries that are there. So these are the numbers for the concentrations of visual artists, oops, visual artists. And um, what's interesting here is that 20% of all visual artists are in the motion picture and video industry in LA compared to only 3% in the US as a whole. And the only other really kind of big standout for these set of cities is that Chicago, 16% of our visual artists work for the advertising industry compared to just 5% in the US. And Minneapolis St. Paul also has a very strong advertising industry and uh, has high numbers of visual artists in that industry. And performing artists, a really interesting one is Boston. 42% of performing artists work in the radio, television, broadcasting, and cable industry. And that's um, quite a bit higher than the US as a whole. And that's, there really is a, you know, a big specialization in that industry in um, Boston. Now artists are also on the move. We hear this a lot and it's a part of the whole cachet, you know, artists moving in and moving out. I'd like to point out that in American society, the average person moves um, every five years. Some of them just move you know, from one house to another or within a metro area, but a lot of them move across state lines. There's also a very important um, uh, age cohort migration where most young people like you that are going to college, um, you know, move, uh, especially at a state level, people come from small towns to bigger towns and so on and so forth. And then there's, there's another migration later, which I'll, I'll show you. But it is interesting by occupation that some occupations move much more than others. So actually it turns out that scientists and engineers move the most. So, you know, in this five year period that we have the census data for, we don't have any of this anymore. This is all gone in the 2010 census. There is no question like this. Where were you five years ago? Um, but interestingly, they have very low levels of self-employment. So scientists and engineers have really good jobs. They have jobs with companies, with the military industrial complex, and with um, government, big government labs and universities. So, but the interest, the next group is artists. So artists which are, who are in this kind of design, entertaining, sports, you know, occupation. 
Um, and again, their, their self-employment rates look low here just because they're in with these other groups. But they also move quite a bit. So where do they move? In 2000, compared to 1995, LA um, received two artists for every artist that left. <laughs> and here are the actual numbers. 20,000 moved in and 9,000 moved out. And you can kind of go down there. Phoenix also was a big net gainer of artists. Now that's because Phoenix as a whole grew fast. So it would have gained every occupation a lot. And the numbers are much smaller. You know, 2,100 moved in, 1,300 left. Um, and so you kind of go on down the line. Interestingly, Minneapolis, St. Paul, which you would think would be an arts magnet because of all our marvelous capacity, lost as many artists, in fact, we slightly more than we gained. And yet, in that decade, we, our rate of artists increase was one of the highest in the US. So what's the, the bottom line? We are home growing more artists than most other metropolitan areas. And that's an interesting story that I'll tell you a little bit more later. Again, some very low, uh, you know, artists out migration, both from the fancy, fast growing San Jose and from Houston. Very interesting. Now, this I think is one of the most interesting things I stumbled over. I just did this almost by accident, but I thought, well, let's see if there's any age relationship to migration of artists. And we found for Minnesota a tremendous amount. So basically, the maroon um, bar is Minneapolis, St. Paul, Twin Cities area, 3.5 million people out of 5 million people in the state of Minnesota. The yellow line is the rest of Minnesota. And what we found was this amazing out-migration of young people, 16 to 24 and 25 to 34. So this is the college and post-college age. Now you're gonna have big migrations of young people out of those places anyway, but extra big for artists. And you know, we know why. It's, it's where you go to you know, really cut your chops and, and do theater and everything else and, and meet people and so on and so forth, get more training, but this is the interesting thing. There's a reverse migration in this age group, 35 to 44. Big, big gain, like 20% gain by greater Minnesota and 10% out migration of artists, net out migration of artists from Minneapolis, St. Paul, metro area. So what is this about? This has gotta be about established artists who are really feel like I'm a visual artist, I can get a beautiful old farmhouse, I know people like this, and you know, I don't. I have gallery representation. I can come and see my friends when I want, or I can travel to perform if I want, or I can write my book and, my, and send it to my publisher in New York. I don't need to be in the Twin City. Maybe they're going home. Maybe not. Who, who knows? Some of them are. Some of them aren't. And um, uh, so that's just, I think, a really interesting phenomenon. The other group is 65 and over. So uh, again, artists don't have to retire, and many of them don't. And so they tend to also actually. It, People in that age group as a whole tend to leave metropolitan areas and go to beautiful, pristine recreation places between 55 and 70 or something like as a whole. Just really interesting. Also, artists are, um, across the United States, more apt to be city-oriented and to live in the core city or the inner city rings. And this is data that we did for Minnesota, again, from the census. So this is Minneapolis, this thing where we actually had so many artists we could cut it up into, for statistical reasons into three chunks and show where they were in St. Paul. And then, and this is way, this is you know like 25% and above of the national norm. And this is you know above the national norm. And all of this is really you know below 75% below the national norm for the share of artists in the resident workforce. This is where artists live, not where they work. So that's a really, really strong, and also we found that um, performing artists were most likely to live close in, followed by musicians, and writers and uh, visual artists who tend to be more, do their work more independently um, were more apt to live farther out. This is what it looked like for Minnesota as a whole. I think this is also really interesting. So you can see that in Northeast Minnesota and Southeastern Minnesota, there are actually more artists in these areas than there are in the suburbs, you know, the farther out suburbs of Minneapolis, St. Paul. Just another really interesting observation about, and I always like to say, in fact, I wrote this piece for Stephen Tepper and somebody else's new issue on work and occupations called Artists Live Everywhere. Because there's this kind of myth that artists are really about you know, big cities and inner cities and that's why we think they're gentrifiers. We forgot to use the gentrifier word, by the way, you know, in our, our stereotypes of artists. And yet, artists live everywhere. Um, this is the map for LA that we drew from our crossover data from the census. And it, you can see this really dark stain here. This is Hollywood, basically. 
So they're like eight to 10 times the share of artists in the resident workforce here than there are in the nation. And all, also, in fact, all of LA except these areas here, which this tends to be the African American neighborhood and then Latino out here, they have under the national average share of artists in the workforce. But there are many, many of them actually who are making music and creating beautiful costumes for you know, Bolivian festivals and things like that that just aren't, don't register as artists in the census. So there's still a lot going on there. Interestingly, this is one of the few exceptions where writers tend, there are a lot of writers in this area, and that's because of script writing for Hollywood. But mostly artists, uh, writers tend to live farther out. Out here, you have lots of musicians and visual artists in um, those neighborhoods. Um, I'm just gonna finish by talking a little bit about um, some, some of the just the support systems for artists. I, I don't want us to forget that artists themselves have created amazing organizations. And this goes by with Springboard as an, as an example of them. There are a lot of unions, some of them have been around a long time, and some of them do wonderful things. The um, Actors Guild has uh, an actors fund that helps to build um, and run housing for retired actors because most of them are too poor to live anywhere. Both in LA and New York, they have big uh, complexes where artists, actors get to live together. Imagine what that would be like. <laughs> Um, in their retirement years. <coughs> National Writers Union organization I belong to that's affiliated with UAW and for a long time you know, uh, offered us very good health insurance through the UAW. The Freelancers Union, a really interesting new organization, relatively new in New York, but working across the country to try to help all those young people who are already, you know, uh, have become contractors doing IT and web design and all this other stuff, try to, you know, have some way of actually organizing and getting better pay and benefits. Professional associations, there's just so many of those. The Composers Forum is based in St. Paul, and it has chapters all over the United States, the American Composers Forum. The National Association of Independent Artists is started by visual artists <coughs> who go to high-end juried art fairs around the United States and wanted some way to communicate with each other about what art fairs were worth going to, what kind of work sold at them, what the weather was like, how well the art fair was young run, and now they've ended up actually making some money by consulting with art fairs, with people who run them, about how to make them better for artists. So just, they're just amazing example of how artists, even though they're atomized in the work that they do, have really uh, often atomized work together. And they're wonderful service programs for artists. The Center for Cultural Innovation in LA, they have been just doing wonderful work for a long time, have two versions of their Business for Art book out. Um, Springboard, another I amazing example. Uh, I did a big project with the Center for Cultural Innovation called the San Jose Creative Entrepreneur Project because the chief strategist of the city said, oh my gosh, we built all these art palaces in downtown San Jose and still the place is totally dead and empty. We need artists. And they looked at my numbers and saw how low they were for San Jose and they said, oh my gosh. So we did this wonderful project with them for a whole year across the whole city government bought in, every agency was involved, and we did a survey of artists. We had an artist town hall that 300 people came from. We learned a lot of interesting things. We learned that in San Jose, they didn't, in the area, they didn't really feel that, house, or, that housing was a problem, but workspace was really a problem, and that was somewhat unusual and so on. So, and now they're implementing a large range of things, including workforce development programs that will work better for artists and so on. There are some great web-based resources for artists, basically regional, minnesotaartist.org. Any artist in Minnesota can put a website up there with information about their work and where to buy it or where to go see it and so on. Chicago, um, Chicago Artist Resource, which was a city-run thing, and now I think the city is under the new mayor, you know, spun it off in some way. Art Home, which is a new project based in Brooklyn, New York, to help artists buy homes is working all over and worked with Springboard on a really interesting project this year. So, um, and I just want to put in a pitch for dedicated spaces for artists. For as, for as good as I think some of these organizations like unions and um, artist services are, in my experience, uh, the thing that most explains why artists are overrepresented in the Twin Cities are these extraordinary organizations, two kinds of organizations, <coughs> artist centers and artists live and work space that have been built up over the years. And I'll just explain them brief briefly. Um, this is the Artist Center study we published in 2006 that um, profiles, I think, 21 different dedicated spaces for artists, artists, membership organizations, you know, founded by artists, built by artists, governed by artists, serving artists. 
Um, this is the open book. It's the new home, sixth home of the uh, Loft Literary Center and also houses the Minnesota Center for the Book Arts and a small nonprofit press. And um, it, this was founded by Garrison Keillor and a bunch of other artists who came out of the University of Minnesota and said, oh, where are we? How are we going to make a living as writers? Uh, and they met in a loft above a bookstore that somebody gave them for free. And one night somebody said, do you think if we taught, offered like a course for poetry for people, anybody would come? The guy's name was Jim Moore. And, and he said, I'll do it. I'll try. And he sat up there and he said he had no idea if anybody would come through the door. 30 people walked in the door. And they realized there was an adult hunger for learning about writing and being with other people and learning about it and so on. So the Loft Literary Center has amazing uh, spaces. All these, do, this is uh, outside of their um, reading space, which is in the back. They just come out of a reading and they're all moving these artist design chairs around and they're talking about it and having a really interesting discussion. This is a writer's studio. I thought when I toured this building and they're opening in 1999, I thought, who would want just a desk and a window and a chair and no phone or no anything and you can bring your computer in? And the answer is a lot of artists, including this guy, Jim Moore, who says he can't work at home. He can't write poetry at home. He comes here to write it. And uh, you can keep your stuff in a locker outside the door. This is there. There's a gallery in the far side and an uh, open space. And we have about um, at least a dozen of these that are discipline specific. So we have the Writer's Loft, the American Composers Forum, the Playwright Center. All of those started in the 70s by artists then adding on over the decades. Now we have a textile center, a high point center for printmaking, et cetera. All of these are membership organizations and that's a big part of their earnings. And some of them have artist co-ops, some of them actually have studios. We have a Northern Clay Center, the textile center, um, uh, where you can actually have studio space to work. And uh, they offer people a chance to teach and make money by teaching and beginning people to apprentice to really great people to hear their stories. They bring in some high-end artists from around the world thanks to our generous foundations in the Twin Cities. They have the Texel Center as the greatest um, fabric art uh, library in the world. And they do uh, membership shows. They do other kinds of shows. They have jury gift shops. So it's really an environment. I really believe in this idea of the dedicated space where you get to really spend time, you walk in a place, you feel a sense of belonging, that it's yours. I feel that way, I took two creative writing courses at the loft, I feel like I belong there. And um, that I think has a very powerful and ongoing influence. There is another kind of artist center which is um, also membership run and run by artists and started by artists that is devoted to communities and neighborhoods rather than disciplines. And this one is intermedia arts and it was actually UC video in the beginning. It was about taking video out in the Vietnam War period into communities and helping empower them. They moved into this neighborhood and they realized they were in the middle of a, 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 a very diverse, immigrant rich, uh, Native American, African American neighborhood. And so they've been working with young people. This is a young man that was really in trouble. Now he's actually teaching other kids how to do beautiful murals. By the way, the head of this was Tom Borup, who some people may know because he's quite an interesting arts consultant, he was actually kicked off the Arts Commission in Minneapolis because he had permitted this beautiful graffiti on the walls of the building. That was like 10 years ago or something. Things have changed. This is a Chad, uh, artist from Chad who had, was driving a cab and they reconnected him with his artwork and also helped him use his artwork to um, have conversations with his community about what could be done to really help them. And this is their annual art car parade, which I'm really sorry you can't see the details of it, but it's really pretty fantastic. So getting out in the community, I think that's one thing I'll say about creative placemaking. It's about getting outside the doors of your organization and going out into the community and really engaging people and using your art and learning a lot from the other people as well. <coughs> it's from our artists. And also artists live in workspaces. So Laura <coughs> works in this building here, the Northern um, Warehouse building. And this is the Tilsner building. Both of these were empty warehouses, had been empty for years. This one didn't have a roof on it. And in the early 90s, when Art Space Projects, which is a nonprofit developer and manager of artists live in workspace, um, you know, did the work to turn these into artists live in work buildings, they were smart to make these first two floors commercial. So that's one of the reasons Springboard is there and the Black Dog Cafe. Um, these have been just amazing. These happen to be artist co-ops, and there's a whole interesting story about that. But this is Jusinius Hall, a filmmaker. 
um, one of the things that Art Space confronted was that to get votes from the city council, um, one city council member said, I will not support bridge financing for this project <coughs> unless you do something in my neighborhood. So they took this old printing plant, which is in Frogtown, or I explained that to you today. They made it into this amazing artist live work housing, <coughs> family housing, the dance space in the basement among artists in his studio. There's a very interesting analysis by Ann Gerwa Nicodemus um, called How Artist Space Matters, where she looked, because these buildings have been in place since the early 90s, we really can see what impact they've had. So she studied their impact on artists, which interestingly she, she found they didn't really raise artists' income to live in these buildings, but it permitted them to quit their day jobs in many cases, or to work a lot less hours at it, and that frees up those jobs for other people. So artists chose you know, not to make more money, but to be able to work more in their artwork, which I thought was fascinating. Also, they have been very, very important as the anchor venues for these art crawls that they have twice the, a year that have really brought so many people into this area and right into artist studios. I bought work there. <clears throat> it's been very good for local businesses. There's been very little displacement. There hasn't really much gentrification. That part of town has been very stable for a long time. Now the farmer's market is open again, and there's a, some uptick, and we'll see what the light rail really does to it, too. But it has not really caused gentrification, and there are various other you know, salutary impacts of the study. It's a very careful study. It's very honest also, um, and very good methodologically. So the reason I think these artist centers and these live works buildings are so important is because Proximity really does create community and um, creating space to where you feel like you belong and co-work with other people and learn across levels of experiences um, has been very, very powerful, I would argue, for um, the Twin Cities arts community. And we did four or five artist centers in the rest of Minnesota, which I don't really have time to present, but they're very interesting as well. So I don't want to say very much about our placemaking, but I want to just point out um, a couple of experiences that I think are instructive of the ways that we can really incorporate the concerns that Robert um, has really placed on the table for us. Both of these are from our, our creative placemaking study. The first one is the case of the light rail system in Portland, which you know we discussed transportation scoring. So Portland was really the first um, city to do a light rail system. They were very nervous that nobody would ride on it because it's like Phoenix or Minneapolis. You know, it's a car driving town, kind of spread out low density. And a guy, like a bureaucrat, a staff guy in the Department of Transportation said, well, how about if we got artists to design the stations and we had the artists to consult with the community about what they would like the station to say about their community? And the engineers went, oh, no, we don't do that. It's too expensive. It'll never go. This guy went all the way to Washington. He went to the Department of Transportation, which is a rich agency, and they were really worried about this. And they said, yeah, go ahead, see what you can do. So this is one of the outcomes from it. This is on the north side of Portland, a heavily Japanese American community. The artist went to the community and said, what would you like? And they said, we'd like the station to tell the story of our incarceration in the desert during World War II. And he went, whoa, or she, I don't know if he hears it. And so this is the outcome. This is on opening day. These are the bronze plaques that are now on the station, but they weren't there yet. And what it says right here, it reproduces the newspaper from the 1940s. It says, alien ouster urged now. And here's an older Japanese lady coming up to read this history, this history that's now there to be read again. And by the way, if you have a chance, you should definitely go to the Heard Museum and see their, has anybody seen the boarding school experience thing they have? It's just spectacular. It's really, really, really wonderful. Um, we went there, spent our morning there today. So, and this is, these are objects from the camps that people had left that they brought in and he made something out of as well. And ridership really has been good in Portland, partly because of that. The other story is the story of Arnoville, um, Louisiana, which is about two hours from New Orleans. We spent some time there last winter coming through. An artist, uh, an established visual artist, uh, came home to take care of his dying father. And he realized that his town was just like sinking into the bayou. There were crack houses. It was just really a mess. And so he decided, what could I do? I'm a visual artist. He started a cafe. And, and there was all this wonderful music around, Cajun music, uh, you know, and not just white people, but there were um, African Americans playing, you know, Creole, Cajun music, and so on. And then he got this idea, how about 
if we use the French language that still exists in our area as a way of really building community. And they started these language tables. And you know they would have the sort of Arcadian, Cajun French speaking people and the Creole, African American speaking people at the same table. And the very first night, some white person tried to correct the pronunciation of French of the Creole person. And the little white haired lady who ran it went, no, 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 we're here to celebrate French. And it doesn't matter how you pronounce French, any pronunciation of French is good. You know, we're not going to go down that route. And it has really worked for them. And now, you know, they've, they've gotten the attention of the French attache, and they've been to France, and they're going to take their old shuttered hospital, uh, you know, that was built in the 60s and was, was too small to succeed, and they're going to turn it into a French language immersion school. It already had people coming from all over the US, in, this is their language table, you know, to learn French in the summer and do these other things. So one artist made this happen. One artist who was from the community made a commitment to stay in the community, and this is what he did. So those are the kinds of things that go on. That's in our creative placemaking study. Finally, I just want to say that we raised the indicators issue this morning. I wrote a very cheeky piece in the fall because I was so distressed, because I was going to conferences and people doing these creative placement projects were saying to me, what are these indicator things that, that Art Place and NEA are doing? And I'm really uh, happy that um, Ian Moss picked this great graphic for the front of the piece. I made this sign but had nothing to say. And it's, I think, a very careful critique of the problem of using the kind of indicators they're considering. I'm very happy to say that by the time this was published, the NEA was already really backing off of using those, but Art Place has um, really done it. And I really recommend you meet, read my piece. It's also in Grantmakers for the Arts um, January issue of their reader. They reprinted it. I brought a few copies with me, too, and a few of my other study copies if you're interested in any of those. That's it. Thank you. I know I talked a long time, and now I'm ready to talk with you. <laughs> or listen to you. So who has interesting stories to share or something I didn't say that you'd like to talk about, or something I did you'd like to disagree with? Robert. Now, now. <laughs> what? Anyway, so are you tracking that kind of pattern of, of, of employment? You know, I would say no. I think there are a lot of professionals doing that in a lot of fields, actually. Uh, but there isn't any easy way to track that without surveying people, really. <laughs> um, and, you know, we don't, we're not ever reflective about what we do in academia or who we are. I mean, you know, we, we never study ourselves. <laughs> isn't that ironic? So I would say no, I don't know how prominent, I certainly know people who do that and they're not necessarily artists, they're people, sociologists and engineers and you know, people do that. I think it's wacky, but they do. I, I wanna say there is, a, you know, there is a kind of whole class system in art just like other things and that's one of the problems that we face and one of the reasons why a lot of people have weird ideas about artists especially visual artists. Visual artists don't have any ongoing property rights in their work, so it makes it a playground for wealthy people. And that's what the New York gallery scene and the LA gallery scene are about. And that's why you get certain people you know, pushed up into the star status and you have certain parts of the city that are. But that's not, that's just a tiny, tiny, tiny share of the artist population. You know? So, yeah. Hi, could you please explain the concept? Can you introduce yourself? Uh, I'm Jeremy Fox. Okay. I'm in yeah, I'm an art administration major. Mm -hmm. Could you please explain the concept of gentrification? I would be very happy to do that. And this is important because the, the, the phenomenon, the word gentrification came in in the 1970s, 80s, way before artists were ever associated with it. So this is kind of the genealogy. In the 60s and 70s, young people began to move back into the city and fix up houses through sweat equity. And mainly, mainly they were young couples, and often they were two-income couples 
where they didn't want to really live in suburbia because that was the pattern. You were supposed to like move out to suburbia if you could. But they wanted to go back and fix up these old houses, and partly because they had jobs in the city. It was too hard to deal with you know, two jobs and commuting and everything else. So, um, and this, you know, this became kind of a thing, and it was, you know, in the areas they went to, basically, it was a good thing they were doing. They weren't really displacing people. And after a while, the development industry really began to say, oh my gosh, there's really a market for housing in the city. So first, these people were going in and doing it themselves because, you know, there wasn't anything for them, and they could do this cheap. But then they began to see, and that's a huge, like in Minneapolis, St. Paul, when I grew up there, nobody lived downtown Minneapolis except people who were living on the streets. And now there's something like 60,000 people living in downtown Minneapolis. And a lot of them are elderly people that they don't want to live out there in suburbia anymore. And they can walk the skyways all winter long in Minneapolis and they can go to the theater and everything else. But a lot of them are young professionals. So, you know, the, our, our problems in cities, I mean, our whole way of living in the United States is so deformed by you know, the fact that there's a development industry that's trying to always develop some new place and, and chill it as the greatest place and tell people that they should be scared because other people are moving in. And it's created this, you know, this really pathological way of living that we have, especially in big cities where there are whole areas, you know, that are only just white. In fact, some colleagues of mine just this week, they did this study of um, income disparity in Minnesota and they found that the, um, that the uh, smallest income disparities in Minnesota were in the suburbs of the Twin Cities. Why? Because they're all the same income. They don't let anybody in. They have rules that nobody else can get in who's lower, so they all group up. By so the biggest disparities are in outstate Minnesota, even though it's not that, you know, the disparities aren't that big, but you know, so on. So anyway, gentrification. So this word actually came from Britain, I think, was there, because they have this notion of the gentry. So the idea of gentrification is that you know, um, developers come in and they buy up space, they tear down old houses, they build new ones, they price them much higher, and then people who live in the neighborhood um, you know, get displaced. And the, the big displacement mechanism is actually because they have to pay property taxes. So if the property values go up, even if they paid off their house, if they own it, or if they're renters, you know, the building, other people are going, to, oh, I can just sell these buildings and they can be torn down and I'll make a lot of money. So that's the gentrification process and it's definitely happened in a lot of cities in different parts of cities and the development industry is very implicated in it. It is partly dependent on demand and that's the point I was trying to make this morning that gentrification, so then this famous book was written by Sharon Zukin who's a very smart, wonderful sociologist called Loft Living. And she documented how in New York in the 1970s, in the whole Soho area, that young you know, people came in. And they weren't all artists, by the way, because I knew a lot of them. Um, you know, they moved into these old lofts. First of all, the lofts were empty, just like these buildings in St. Paul. They were empty. They, were, they were, had been manufacturing lofts right in Manhattan. And they were empty because the, the companies had decamped. So they were gone. So, you know, and they would fix them up and everything else. So pretty soon the developers saw, oh, you know, there's a lot of desire. You know, you have to understand about New York City that every rich person in the world wants an apartment in New York City. There's an endless amount of pressure. Uh, I mean, the cost of living is just out of this world in New York City, especially in Manhattan. So this kind of a process that she described is very particular to New York in a way. But there are echoes of it in other places. In Philadelphia, they didn't really find that because nobody's moving to Philadelphia. Nobody wants to have an apartment in Philadelphia. But it does happen in certain neighborhoods, and the development industry has become very, very good. At, like when I went to look for my house in Minneapolis, they took me to an area and they said, this is an emerging neighborhood. I said, what does that mean, an emerging neighborhood? Well, they said it's sort of low income now, but it's really on its way up. I mean, this is the way they create, and you, you're the buyer thing, you don't know anything about, you know, they create this sort of sense, oh, it would be good to buy here because the prices are going up and so on and so forth. So, so that was gentrification. And because of Sharon Zukin's book, unfortunately, you know, now lots of people think that artists cause gentrification, that artists move into a neighborhood and then, you know, their presence causes other people to want to come and, and that drives up the prices, et cetera. I think developers try to use artists in that way, but I think there are very, very few instances, I'm not saying there aren't any, 
where actually some group of artists is the reason for the turnover and development, et cetera. But that's what gentrification is, and it's a very serious issue. And it's very problematic because of the way the, that Art Place in particular is running its projects. So many of their indicators, and this is a part of my indicators complaint, are really things that reward things like cell phone use. Oh, this I, I find this is so interesting. So uh, cell, cell phone use, especially on Friday and Saturday night. Okay. So who is using a cell phone in the city on Friday and Saturday? First of all, there's all this data, some really great data, which I, I quote in there, showing that you know a lot of poor people don't have cell phones at all. A lot more than you would think don't. These were surveys of people who took the bus in LA, especially older people. They don't have them at all. OK, if you're going to a jazz concert or a symphony or something, you're going to be turning your cell phone off. You're not going to be using it. So there's going to be no activity level on Friday and Saturday night. Who's going to be using them? Young, hip people. So. Uh, this, it is a problem. I think that there's, you know, there's a whole organized urban development industry. There's a, you know, Urban Land Institute. I gave a talk there last year. The woman who just stepped down from executive director gave a talk there. And you know, you can just see all these people there salivating to find the next new place and be nice to drop, move, drop a little arts in there, and that that would make it really great for them to redevelop as condos and so on and so forth. I want to also point out that there are huge. Oh, one of their other indicators is the percent of people living in the area that are working. OK, so you could have big condo towers in a neighborhood where everybody went off and worked somewhere else. And there was absolutely nothing going on there during the day. And they would come back. They would look really good by their indicator. You know, That doesn't have anything to do with activity, artistic activity, or anything going on in the neighborhood. So you know, that, that's my and But those kind of indicators are coming from a certain sensibility that really, you know, uh, as, as the guy who does their method stuff, who's basically not very well trained, you know, uh, wrote this piece with the woman who runs a thing called The Young and the Restless. That's really their idea of what's really great. Oh, and they have these, uh, they have these diversity indicators that are, um, it, the diversity indicator is that you should have some of different kinds of people in the neighborhood. Oh, that's fine, but what if you're in the big area of LA that's all Vietnamese people? Because nobody else would have them or they couldn't afford to go, or they were helping each other you know, get established, you're going to penalize them with an indicator because they're not mixed? Or how about age diversity? There's no age diversity indicator in there. Shouldn't, you wanna, shouldn't we encourage neighborhoods that have people of all ages in them? They're just all these different issues. So thank you for asking that. And did I make it clear what gentrification is? Yes. That's what gentrification is. <laughs> <laughs> and anybody's free to disagree with me on this also. It's an important issue, yes. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. T tell me your name again. Yeah, I'm, I'm Michael Rowe. I'm presenting here tomorrow. And we, I mean, a lot of conversations that we've never even together that I brought to hand. Mm. So um, I'm, I'm trying to sort of figure out some questions. It's really actually nice to hear you um, speak and get a sense of your point of view because you are represented when not in the room and the data. Strategies do you um, um, propose for allies who find themselves 
mentioned land and roofs that he can't see. It just right. be everywhere in your attention, get articulated for you by right. someone else. Right, great. Well, thank you. That's a really challenging question. First of all, I will tell you that I wrote the creative placemaking indicators critique um, to try to really influence what these two organizations were doing. And I did send it to every um, program officer. I didn't, in, in one or two cases, I actually knew the presidents of the foundation, but I sent it to the people who were the research and methodology people, and I sent it to the arts program people, and all the foundations that fund our place. And I know it made a difference. And now I'm following up with some of them. So I'm actually sitting down with them. I just made a date with the Ford Foundation person to have a conversation about where does he think creative placemaking is going. And I have a feeling that he was, you know, uh, someone who was also very concerned and critical about some of that. So, so that's one thing. Where I feel like I have some access, I know somebody, or uh, then I, I've really worked at that level quietly. <laughs> Um, and I wrote the piece um, to really get it out there on the table. And I think it's got some really great arguments and great examples in it. And I just felt it was a traumatic thing for me to write, but I felt like it was an important thing to do. Um, uh, you know, it is, I think the Richard Florida era is kind of over, actually. So I think he just disappointed so many people. And actually, he wasn't really. Really? Well, I think you can co-opt it. You know, that's what I would say. For one thing, you've got to find the, there are already people doing this. I mean, this wasn't a new thing. There were people who had already been doing this for like, in fact, we got this just impassioned letter from a theater director in Connecticut who said like, hello, I've already been doing this for 20 years and now I've already done it. I, I can't get any funding from this, but the state of Connecticut wants to change all its arts funding to create a placemaking funding and where does that leave me? And I was like going, what are we going to say to this guy? You know? <laughs> Which we did talk to him about it. And, but um, so, uh, so that's one thing, just finding people in your community to push back on it and encouraging people to push back on it. And um, you know, one of the other things I do, so one of the, and I've written a little bit about this, but I've done a lot more public speaking on it. So there's this idea about the cultural district, right? We're going to, like New Mexico, we're going to dub certain places cultural districts. And Louisiana has one too, but they've softened it a lot, so now lots of places can be cultural district. And there are, there are incentives to go with it. You know, you get, you know, sales tax breaks, or you get, you know, a little chunk of money or something like that. So, especially in cities, I think it's a terrible idea. And actually, I often put up pictures in Minneapolis and St. Paul where none of our major arts institutions are next door to each other. They're, they're spread around. And all of, we have like 80 theater companies that either have their own, own, either own or rent their space, they're all spread over. All these artist centers are spread all over. And I like to present that as a mosaic. And I actually tell the story when I moved back to Minneapolis uh, and was staying with my brother and sister-in-law. I've been gone for 35 years. Uh, they go out every Wednesday night. They have five children. And I said, where do you go? And they said, oh, we go to a different neighborhood every time. I said, like what? Well, we go to the Jungle Theater at Lynn Lake, and we go to the Greek place for dinner before, and we go to the Tapas Bar afterwards. And they said, tomorrow night's our date night. You can come with us. We're going to see Buena Vista Social Club. You know, it's at the art theater. And then we're going to buy the CD. And then we're going to go out to the Italian restaurant. And that's what, you know, that's what they do. So I got this idea of the mosaic, which I counterposed to the cultural district. And I just, we just had a big thing in Duluth, led, by the way, by the art school dean, who was a very amazing guy and was a theater director in Chicago for 20 years. And he really knows how to cast and direct. He's organized the whole Duluth Arts Community. But he really is in favor of this little two or three block cultural district in Duluth. And I made the argument in my talk, and there were a lot of people in the room who were really resonated. I said, you don't want to do this art district thing. Because for one thing, it suggests that every other place is not an arts district. Every place is an arts district. So I said, what you want to do is you want to show the mosaic. You want to encourage people to move. And then I just listed all the, your symphony's over there. Your major art institute is down there. Your playhouse is over there. The university is up the hill. You know, you've got this old forge that people are making something out of. You've got that waterfront where all this stuff goes on in the summer. Make a map. And pretty soon these young people in the room are going to go, I'll make the map. And so, you know, just really trying to undermine it by building on, you know, the other stuff that's there and pushing back. And um, so, and also, I just think like the, the Richard Florida ideas. I mean, he really didn't have, you know, Richard Florida's creative class, you know, wasn't about artists. It was really about 
everybody who had a college degree, period. Because that's how, that's how we define the creative class. All the occupations that are defined by higher educational attainment are in the creative class, and all the rest of us aren't. All crafts people, not in the creative class. So, and you know, sad to say, you know, the scientists and engineers that were supposed to be attracted by, you know, the, these, you know, inner city places where artists, they never went there. They don't like to live there. They don't like to live in suburbia, almost all of them. So that was my prior life when I was studying the military industrial complex. So, you know, it's really, his, his thing is just very thin. It's for, what I found really sad and pathetic is that, you know, it was so powerful for the arts community because they felt like here was somebody who was finally speaking for them. My university president invited Richard Florida to come and do one of his, you know, great conversations up on stage with him. And he asked me to write the questions. I was so pissed off. And so I wrote these questions and I handed it to my graduate students. I said, would you go read this book again, see if you have any questions. I said, I have a few. So one of them came back and she said, what, is it, what, are the creative, what are the political implications of the creative class? Are they going to rise up and take us in some direction? And what would that be? And our president asked that question. It was the last question. And Richard Florida was totally tongue-tied. It was like such a, just a great moment. Because he didn't have any answer to that. There was no political implication to it. So I would just say that, you know, yeah, we need a lot of educating. Maybe we need somebody to write something that really articulates a different vision, not a critique of Richard Florida, but, you know, really emphasizes these other visions. And, um, you know, so I'd love to just hear about that and if other people have ideas, because I think that still is a really key thing. I still see this cultural districts idea is like very attractive to people. And also just this, I, the other powerful thing we haven't talked about tonight is really this thing about engagement. So. There is a big change going on in the art world where people who patronize the arts, especially young people, they don't want to go sit in a theater and be in the dark and have the action up on the stage. They care about the venue. They care about who else. They want to be more engaged in actually curating the event. This is what you know, these various observers are saying. And they want to see stuff you know, performed and displayed in new kinds of settings. And they want to do more of it themselves. This is the really exciting part. This is the thing that should make every mayor's heart beat fast, you know, because this stuff mainly goes on in cities. Although some suburban areas are doing it too. So that's a whole nother challenge for the arts community. It's very challenging to traditional arts organizations, especially performing arts organizations. You write a play, you've got characters, you're cast. How do you make it more interactive? There are ways of doing it. Sonia, I think, has been doing a lot of really interesting work on that, coming from theater and so this is the future, really. And this is the only way we're going to, right now, by the way, you know, artists are way down on the totem pole in people's you know, sort of like admiration for occupations. And we're really small. We're tiny. We're, you know, we're, we, we don't make it on the map. Did Bill Clinton, in his brilliant 50-minute talk at the Democratic Convention last summer, did he mention arts and culture once? No. He went through the whole lexicon of things that matter to Americans, and it wasn't there. We got to be there. And one of the ways, and I think it's happening. See, this is what I think is so amazing. I think people all over the place are picking up their high school instruments and singing with each other. They're going into their community plays. They're doing more artwork themselves. There's just a lot they're doing with their communities. They're, in the Native American community, the reassertion of language and learning language and the teaching of these traditional art forms and the encouragement to young people to do new things. In Latino communities in LA, the same thing. You know, Organizations where the young people support the grandmother's knitting and they support the hip hop that the young people are doing. And, they, and that's a formal agreement that they have in their organization. So there just is a lot of that going on. And that is what we can really build on. So that's, I think, the really hopeful thing. Hello, my name is Deborah Webb. I'm from Seattle University. And our city has a cultural space initiative right now with a designated person that's going to be leading the charge to really create a plan for long-term cultural space. And what we're finding from the community so far is that they're wanting two things, intergenerational cultural space as well as interdisciplinary space. And 
I'm wondering if you're seeing that as a trend or a potential future success and we're gonna blaze that trail. Because um, the examples that you showed of cultural space that um, were really successful are very discipline specific. And what we're hearing from our community is they're, they're not wanting those silos of disciplines. They're really wanting that. Inner, and also families, artists are getting older, they're having families. They wanna learn the cello while their child is learning the violin and they want a space to do that and not have to drive into the density of the city. And so I'm just wondering if, if you're seeing that or hearing that around the city at all, or at the country? Oh, you don't know, but I'm really so glad to hear that you're talking. I think there are little signs of it. We had a huge flap in Minneapolis, uh, well, in the Twin Cities about 10 years ago. One of our big foundation did this whole study about art in the suburbs, and they encouraged a lot more sort of artistic stuff in the suburbs. And the established arts organizations got really upset because, you know, we've been losing population from our inner cities, you know, for 20 or 30 years. And they thought this was like, oh, the funders are gonna fund stuff out there and they're not gonna fund us. You know, they immediately had this them versus us thing. So, you know, we had to work really hard. Like in Hopkins, this inner ring suburb, an old Jewish suburb, you know, they have pawn shops on their main street. And these older people in the community, mostly they're in little World War II, you know, post-World War II houses, they want to stay in the community, but it's kind of going downhill. So the city of Hopkins decided to build this visual and performing arts center. A city built and owned performing arts center. And it was like the first one in the Twin Cities. And again, there was so much controversy about it. So I just started saying to people, look, if people go there to hear Laura Caviani, our best woman jazz pianist in Twin Cities, play jazz, then the next time it plays, she plays downtown, they're going to want to go see her. Don't see this. You know, you've got a potential huge audience out there that doesn't go to anything, but if it's nearby, they will. So, you know, accept that. And interestingly enough, now there's a lot of senior housing built right across the street from this place where there, where there wasn't any before. And there are restaurants and there are, you know, music venues in this, you know, small four or five block area of this thing. So that's what I think we really need. And I'm so happy to hear about the intergenerational thing because I, that's what I see in, in um, Native American communities, in immigrant communities in LA, it is intergenerational, and they, and they want it to be that way. And I think you know, generational segregation is the biggest threat in American culture we have, and there are all these right-wing people trying to pit old, pit, you know, pit old people against young people. I mean, it's so d disgusting, it's unbelievable. And a lot of marketers are trying to only market you know, to one, so I think this is another place where arts and culture can do a wonderful job, and I'm really, you know, very, I'd love to hear more about actually what you're, and I think it's really good to talk back about that, because I do think the intergenerational thing is important, and the participatory thing, and wanting to do it in your neighborhood is really important. So, thank you for that. Somebody else had their hand up? Yes, it's time to go. Okay. 